the memory is extraordinarily labile. Um, each time we remember something, we remember the last time we remember it. So memories are constantly being reconstructed in our memory, and that's all. You can show that biochemically as well. Um, memories, short-term memories, are very, very susceptible to blocking by certain sorts of drugs and inhibitors of protein synthesis. My key problem is with young people, they have a relentless focus on the happenings of the moment, so they cannot remember yesterday, and I worry that they will not be able to develop a social identity other than as part of today's happenings, and I think that is going to be very detrimental to how their personalities emerge and shape over time. We live in a, a culture and a world where there is a great premium placed on telling our stories and of course as a biographer I should be pleased about this but it also worries me because it seems to me there's a lot of emphasis on the need to tell one's story, the duty to tell one's story, the right to tell one's story. Hi thank you very much for coming to the session. Um, memory and forgetting. That's what we're here to talk about. Um, memory seems so important. We rely on it for every area of life, from education to social relationships. We celebrate those with good memory skills on programmes like Mastermind and University Challenge. We feel that our memories are absolutely central to who we are. But could it be that forgetting is more valuable, especially in an age where technology allows us to instantly access any fact? Does forgetting, rather than remembering, create an individual? Um, so we're lucky to have three very different perspectives on that question, um, I hope. Um, we've got Stephen Rose, um, a neurobiologist who's worked on biological processes involved in memory formation, and most recently on Alzheimer's. Um, and he's author of The Making of Memory, which won the Royal Society Science Book Prize back in 1993. Um, we've got Sue Bailey, a, a, psych a child psychiatrist for over 30 years. Sue has been called as an expert witness in high-profile criminal cases and is currently president of the Royal College of Psychiatry. And Hermione Lee, um, president of Wolfson College Oxford and biographer of Virginia Woolf and Edith Wharton. Um, she's also a former chair of the Man Booker Prize for Fiction. Memory is a fundamental characteristic of what it is to be human. It constitutes us through our entire life process. The fact that we can remember events that took place in our childhood, even at my advanced age or even older than that, is actually a tribute to an extraordinary phenomenon. The fact that every molecule, every cell in our body has turned over, has changed many billions of times over that period of time, and yet it gives us continuity. It constitutes us, therefore, as an individual, which is why, of course, disorders of memory and the loss of memory is so devastating so far as an individual is concerned. If you take the catastrophic losses of memory that go with various forms of stroke or dementia or in particular Alzheimer's disease which we're all familiar with then you then the person within that condition loses the continuity of their own existence and we won't know until unfortunately any of us come to suffer those conditions what it feels like to be inside it but we all can I think intuit what it feels like to be the carer or the lover of such a person so in that sense, memory is extraordinarily important and fundamental, and how it actually works, how it's encoded in the brain, remains an enormous and important mystery. I've been working on the trying to understand these cellular processes through about half a century of research life, and I have to confess, and I'll probably do it more in the discussion that follows, I know less now than I thought I did when I started. <laughs> I know a lot about the molecules and a lot less about memory than I thought that I did. But the other important aspect of the discussion today is also going is also about forgetting. And one of the things that um, I will want to argue as the discussion goes on, and I won't explore it further here, is the extent to which forgetting is also extraordinarily functionally important for us and individual individuals. It's not merely that we don't need to remember today where we parked our car yesterday. Um, that form of short-term memory is, uh, is functional to us, but also forgetting longer-term events in our lives may also be important. And indeed, there's a certain case for certain forms of social amnesia, which I hope we come on to at the end. I also want to talk about forgetting and loss of memory. 
It leaves you with no sense of identity, no ability to form relationships and no concept of future. Living and dying with the dementia, fading away, not knowing you. Everyone is a stranger. You forget everything about what makes you. What is left becomes a vacant, staring shell, without a history, without a future. If you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you are going. This leaves you fearful of and about everything. People avoid you and don't know what is happening. They treat you like the person you were, or worse still, they treat you like a child. But you are neither. You are trapped. Collective memory, peoples of memory, tribal identities can lead to good and bad in equal measure. The Holocaust gives the Jewish community a sense of purpose and future. But conflicts across the world and closer to home, this week on the streets of Greenwich, have arisen out of collective memories, however laid down or fashioned through history and teaching. In my day-to-day -day work, I deal with people who've um, experienced trauma. Uh, and Stephen's already given you the neuroscience, but part of the neuroscience is the effective, the feeling state that goes with trauma. And it's my challenge to work with patients to help them move through their trauma. And to do that, we have to deal with the autonomic nervous system, which gives these dreadful feeling states that go with traumatised memories. And we have to get the prefrontal cortex to inhibit that autonomic arousal, so people can find calm and peace, not that they forget the trauma that's been done to them, but they can start to live with it and look forward. I, I'm not a scientist, I'm a biographer, and I wanted to start with a tiny short story about uh, memory. Uh, the philosopher Isaiah Berlin uh, went to visit the the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova in Leningrad in 1945, and he spent what he would then describe as an unforgettable night talking to Anna Akhmatova about poetry and about what had happened under Stalin and about mutual friends and about their lives. Incredibly intense meeting. He didn't write it down. Uh, 35 years later, uh, he wrote an account of it, which was extremely vivid, and said word for word the things she'd been saying to him, as if he had had a tape recorder in his pocket and had then translated back from the Russian in, into English. And he heads this essay, Meetings with Russian Writers, with a quote from Akhmatova, which says, um, every attempt to produce coherent memories amounts to falsification. So it's like a challenge to the reader. And then he footnotes the essay, I have never kept a diary, and this account is based on what I now remember, or recollect that I remember. And I think recollect that I remember is a very interesting phrase. So this is a, in, in factual terms, this is a somewhat dubious uh, recollection, but it feels completely vivid, convincing, emotionally true. So as a biographer, um, one has to make up one's mind what one thinks about those sorts of memories, which are, I think, called re reconstructed uh, memories, sort of dramatised memories. Of course, he told the story many times in the interim between the meeting and writing it down. So he had kind of set it and dramatised it. So there's a question about whether one should uh, value such memories as absolutely true or whether the important thing about them is that they are true to the person who tells them. So it's what the meaning is for them, for that, what I recollect that I remember. So that's one thing I, I would be very interested in, in hearing about, the value of such, uh, of such memories. And, then, and, and, and just like Stephen, the other thing that I'm very interested in, in thinking about is the value of forgetting and the usefulness of forgetting. So I wonder if we could start by just talking a little bit about the nature of memory and what we mean by memory, because what came out of what you were saying, Sue, and you, Hermione, is um, it's perhaps not quite what we think of. Like, the naive view of memory would be that we're perhaps... It's like opening a book and you see what's written there, and it's kind of, it's kind of a mental thing, and it's quite accurate. But it sounds like you were talking about effective memory or the idea that we're actually re actively reconstructing memories. So, Stephen, I always wonder what your perspective of that is from the biological point of view. Yes, let, let me pick up from, to start with, from where Hermione left off. And she made a number of distinctions, once between recollection and recognising and remembering. If you see, if you're asked to describe the face of a person you know, you may not do it very well, but if you see that person, you'll instantly recognise them. So there is this distinction between what we, what we can 
put into our memory and what is the, the appropriate trigger we can recollect, we can recognise in that sort of way. There are classical distinctions in, that, that, that are made in memory between um, knowing how and knowing that, for example, and these are, are distinctions which you can show are uh, affected by different sorts of brain lesions. Knowing that a bicycle is called a bicycle is different from knowing how to ride a bicycle, <laughs> and you lose the, the, the word memory long before you learn, you lose the ability, in, even in Alzheimer's disease, to put on your clothes and dress and know what they are. They go much later. Um, secondly, there's a distinction between very short and very long-term memory. We know that there are regions in the brain, particularly the hippocampus, which is particularly, which is a region of the cortex deep, deep within the brain, um, which is um, which, which is crucial for the um, registration of new memories. But we don't know what happens, if you like, in terms of brain processes as to how the memories are then diffused um, or, or distributed throughout the brain. The one thing that we can say is that brain memory is not like computer memory, and that is an analogy, a metaphor, which is thoroughly and entirely misleading. The final thing I'll just say at this particular moment um, is again a, a riff on what Hermani was just saying, and that is that memory is extraordinarily labile. Um, each time we remember something, we remember the last time we remember it. So memories are constantly being reconstructed in our memory, and that's all. You can show that biochemically as well. Um, memories, short-term memories, are very, very susceptible to blocking by certain sorts of drugs and inhibitors of protein synthesis. <clears throat> but once the memories are encoded, are in the brain, they're resistant. But if you re-evoke the memory, either in a person or an, or, or, or an animal, and at the same time administer the same the, the drug which blocks it, the newly re-evoked memory is blocked in its turn. And that says that each time we remake, we remember something, we are remaking it at the molecular and the cellular level, and not just in our, our emotional world. One comment also on, on the question about emotional memory, that is crucially involved in um, another region of the brain called the amygdala and in um, it's very clear that we remember things and you can sh again show this experimentally both in animals and in humans that memories that have an emotional significance for us are much more important and much better remembered than those are purely cognitive. Our brains and our memories did not evolve, evolve to enable humans to play chess or even do maths or do science. They evolved as a survival mechanism, and a survival mechanism means that we have to be able to, our, um, f our evolutionary ancestors had to be able to remember, have an emotional relationship with what was good, what was bad, what had to be avoided, what had to be hunted, and what had to be had. So memories have an evolutionary significance, which is tied up with emotion and not with cognition. Did you want to jump in? I, I just want to jump in because I've just been, I mean, this is trespassing on your field, but I've just been reading a very fascinating piece about a man called Henry M Mollison. You all know about this. By, yes. yes, by a woman called Susan Suzanne Corkin, who, who had his hippocampus sucked out, is that right? Is that, and, and so for 55 years, he couldn't remember anything at all that had just happened. So every single time you came back into the room, you had to um, reintroduce yourself to him and start the, start the conversation uh, again, which is a familiar syndrome for people with, with, with memory loss. But he did have some emotional memories, like the first time he ever took a plane ride with his dad, and he remembered everything about that and would constantly refer to it, so which suggested to her that there were parts of the the brain other than the hippocampus and the, the other bit, the name which I always forget, yeah. uh, the amygdala, which, which were functioning. And this reminded me of the way in which writers uh, will often write about early memories with an extraordinary intensity of emotion as if it is happening there and then, just to give one very, very short example. Virginia Woolf came to write her memoir, unfinished memoir, towards the end of her life, and she went back to her childhood in St Ives, decades and decades before. She says sometimes she can go back to it so completely that she says, I can reach a state where I seem to be watching things happen as if I were there. That is, I suppose, that my memory supplies what I had forgotten, so that it seems as if, if it were happening independently, though I am really making it happen. Uh, in certain favourable moods, she adds, memories, which she defines as what one has forgotten, come to the top. And then she goes on to say, if, if that's the case, could they still be in existence? Could those things that we remember actually be there, somehow existing and continuing to have 
it's like Back to the Future, a, a life outside of. And I was reminded by the, the, the Corkin case uh, of those sorts of incredibly intense emotional memories, which seem to still be still be going on in one's life. This is scientifically. It's a nice diagnosed. resonance between the scientific yeah. understanding and yeah. the, uh, the literary one. Um, so, Sue, I wanted to ask. Oh. Sorry. No, I'm just saying, go ahead. I was talking. <laughs> no, I wonder, I'm interested in your take on emotional memory and can that be separated from the informational content of memory? Well, maybe the best way is to give you a worked example. I, <laughs> I, I deal with young people who kill other people. And the memory I hold is of a young man who killed his social worker. And we could all recognise that his mother and his social worker looked like each other. But 18 months into treating him, the evoked emotional memory was not of them looking similar. It was that his mother had a high-pitched, squeaky voice, and as a teenager, she was always on his case. And the social worker had a high-pitched, squeaky voice. And this was the sensory modality in which was the trigger to him to kill his social worker. So I think emotive, emotional memories are very strong and very powerful. Can I ask you a question about that? Because there's a lot of therapeutic suggestions which says that it's a good idea to re-evoke suppressed and hidden memories. Mm. Um, in what's called post-traumatic stress disorder and so on. One argument is you re-evoke the memory and then you can actually introduce a drug which will erase the memory. Anyone who's seen the film Gattaca knows that sort of story. But I'm not at all sure whether, it, whether the Freudian idea or that idea of re-evoking memory in order to come to terms with it is better than forgetting it. I think med medical psychotherapists would say it is better to re-evoke the memory and they wouldn't particularly look to um, pharmacological treatments. They'd look to working through with the patient in a doctor-patient relationship to calm that memory. But, but isn't there, aren't there also arguments, I'm speaking out of ignorance, um, but aren't there also arguments that when there is a massive traumatic event uh, and... and uh, uh, psychotherapists, as it were, come to work with the people who have suffered <coughs> the event and, uh, and ask them to <laughs> narrate their memory of the event. I have, I have seen it said that this can actually be kind of <laughs> counterproductive or if it happens at the wrong time, uh, it can actually, it, it can mean that the trauma uh, is replicated more acutely for a longer period of time. Is this gobbledygook or is there something in there? No, there, there is substance in that, but I think the point is that the person in front of you needs to be at the right time in the right place <coughs> to receive the help. And also, people talk about trauma, but the young people I work with, unfortunately, have multiple layers of trauma. So sometimes <coughs> people are dealing with the wrong trauma, and sometimes what to us seems a serious trauma is not. They've sailed through that, and it's something that seems very minor, to us, which is huge to them. And I don't know whether there's any evidence of being able to distinguish that in the brain. I don't think so, no. I mean, you can't really distinguish sites of memory in the brain, apart from knowing what the hippocampus does. Once the memories have become, if you look, diffused through the, through, through the brain, it's, the whole brain is a dynamic system, and mm -hmm. the, the encoding is, therefore, is a mystery. So we know, as experimental scientists, very much more about what happens in learning, when we can look at them in experimental animals or even in brain imaging, you can look at the molecular and cellular things that are going on in the hippocampus in other brain regions. Um, we don't know anything about what, where memory is between the time someone has learnt something mm. and the time they remember it. I mean, mm. it, could, it could be anywhere. If you listen to Rupert Sheldrake, it's not in the brain at all. But <laughs> I'm not inclined to go that far. I just wanted to say something about HM, who is um, a lot of our understanding of brain processes in, in, uh, in general come from accidents and injuries. Mm. And HM is the most famous iatrogenic accident in, mm. in brain history. And he was studied for sort of 50 years and produced endless theses and research papers, not necessarily to his own advantage. But the important thing about HM's memory is that he could remember very well everything that happened up to the time of the memory of the time when the hippocampus was removed. He didn't need the hippocampus to re-invoke those memories. They were somewhere else in the brain and could be recalled. But not, as Hermione said, nothing new could he hold for more mm. than a few seconds. Mm -hmm. But is it, would it be correct then not n never to talk about memory? Is memory a misconception? Should yes. we always be talking about memories or memorising? Or... I, I, think, I think we should always talk about learning and remembering as active mm. nouns, of active verbs, rather than a noun right. which reifies a thing as if right. it's not like a computer memory. <laughs>
a man who couldn't remember anything, but there are also people who remember too much, is that right? And what do they tell us about the downside of memory or the that's, importance of forgetting? That's, 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 that's actually sort of quite fascinating. And um, uh, there are two ca cases which the, any neuroscientist will cite. One is um, of a patient studied by the Soviet neuropsychiatrist Alexander Luria, who could remember apparently absolutely everything. And there's a classical case in which Luria gives him some nonsense formula to remember in about 1938, 1939. Um, and then the war intervenes. Luria sees him after the war and says, do you remember? And Sheroshevsky, the patient, goes on, yes, yes, we were in this room. There was a sunlight outside. I remember the dapples. You were wearing a light gray suit. And the memory went blah, 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 this nonsense formula which ran on for about this sort of long. And asked how he could remember it. He said, well, he put every symbol in the memory in a place that he was familiar with, the roof of his house, the front door of his house, the railings he was walking along and so on. And he simply walked the memory. And that's the way that professional memory men actually are known to work, with those that I've interviewed anyhow. But did he do it involuntarily? Yes. He was also a synesthetist, and he actually sort of um, melded colours and, and, and words and names. The other one, which is much more your line, of course, which every neuroscientist evokes, is a beautiful short story by Jorge Luis Borges called The Mind that Funeth the Memorius, yes. <laughs> a man who could remember absolutely yes. everything. And there's a beautiful description in the Funeth story. And Sheroshevsky couldn't hold a job down because he couldn't even synthesise someone looking face on profile mm. like that. And Funeth dies young of an overdose of memory, as Borges mm -hmm. puts it. Well, this is what I'm interested in, is the, the downside. And does that tell us, what does that tell us about the importance of, of forgetting in terms of defining who we are? It's, it seems to me that forgetting is absolutely functional to remembering things which ought to be relevant yes. to us, but you would know that better than I do. Yeah. There are those who are just imploded with so many memories mm. that they just become non-functional. Mm. And how, I mean, how do you go about forgetting something, though? If you want to forget a painful memory, it's... It, because it's a, it's a passive thing, not an active thing. You can't will yourself to forget something, or, or can you? Ask the therapist. <laughs> <laughs> you can start to, and, and, and I mean, we're here today um, sat in a room full of words, but I think one of the best ways of downloading a memory and allowing it to be forgotten is through drawing and painting and sculpture, and that's the medium in which I work with most of the children I deal with. And it's a much stronger way to do this, and it's easier to help them to set the memory aside. And is it a case of setting it aside or is it changing the emotional content? It's changing the emotional content that goes with it so you can get a sense of calm instead of a sense of anger, grief, sadness, anger and despair. And uh, Hermione, for you, what's the importance of forgetting? I kept thinking about Mr Memory in 39 Steps. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and isn't it true that, that technically if somebody has a, a memory that, which cannot distinguish or select that there, there are various strategies that you can internally burn the, the, a list of things in your mind as an image and, and then you can get rid of those things? Is that, is that just rumour or can that... I, well, I don't know. Because the, 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 <laughs> there, there are memory strategies. Mm. As I was saying, if you ask the... the, 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 the I once did a talk with a guy who was the memory champion in Britain who could, and he came on stage and he showed he could remember the entire contents of the Middlesbrough telephone directory. He'd throw pages of the directory out to an audience like this and say, call out a number, and he'd tell you the name that was the address that was associated with the number. And he you know, clearly had the strat that particular yeah, sort of yeah. strategy. I can, all I can tell you is it doesn't work for me. I <laughs> don't I, I, in answer to the question I should have uh, I should have answered, I've got a larger anxiety about m memory and retelling, which is that it seems to me, you may not think this is right, but it seems to me we live in a, a culture and a world where there is a great premium placed on telling our stories. And, of course, as a biographer, I should be pleased about this. But it also worries me, because it seems to me there's a lot of emphasis on the need to tell one's story, the duty to tell one's story, the right to tell one's story. And so people quite often, I think, are asked to tell the story of their past, to cast their mind back. Many children do this of their parents. They want to know their parents' stories. And quite often the parent doesn't want to tell the story. Or there has been some history, maybe it is a, 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 a terrible major history of being in the Holocaust or some, some such history. Uh, and there are many national examples, I think, of such histories where people 
would not only would prefer not to tell their stories, but are helped by not telling their stories. It is their chosen mode of survival, not to tell their stories. And although as a biographer, of course, I want everyone to tell their stories, whether they be accurate or not, I also have a lot of respect uh, for people who don't want to tell their stories and actually would rather not remember. So I don't know whether this is a bad thing or not. Well, Sue, what do you make of that? Because do you have an experience of have, making people remember stuff they don't want to remember? Um, I try not to do that, but that sometimes happens because of the nature of work I do. I, I, think, I think there are um, two things there. Um, one is, I think, on the surface, there does seem to be more pressure to tell your story and actually to not actually tell true stories. Um, it's a bit like having the right sort of trainer, almost. But if you go to New Zealand, you're expected to give your history when you meet and greet. So I think it's something that's always been there, but I think it's how things get used and abused over time. I just wanted to, to follow up on when bad memories can be good for us, I suppose. Or, are, you know, are they always bad and should be forgotten or... What are the benefits of revisiting bad memories? Well, that's what I was asking Sue earlier on, because I'm, 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 I mean, she, she was convinced it was right to re-evoke memories in order to deal with them by therapy. I'm not sure why, except professionally, she would argue it was better to re deal with them um, by therapy rather than by pharmacologically, even if it was possible. Certainly there are a number of, because of the huge in I I increase in PTSD in the States, of so people coming, particularly the guys coming back from unjust wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and such places, who have horrific memories, or in Vietnam, for instance, um, the, a number of American uh, memory companies have tried to patent drugs which would actually sort of enable you to pharmacologically erase memories in this sort of way. But um, I'm quite sure that there um, are memories which are not appropriate to revise. I mean, there are lots of people from the uh, veterans of the First World War or the Second World War who would not wish to tell their sons, their daughters, their family the memories they had because they were too disturbing. It's better to layer them down and to, in so far as possible, to forget them. Mm -hmm. Whether everything, anything is really completely forgotten or is simply inaccessible is something, again, mm -hmm. we've actually sort mm -hmm. of no way, no, we've no way of actually mm -hmm. making that distinction. Is it a form of, I'm thinking of the First World War song that Joan Little used in <laughs> Oh, What a Lovely War, you know, oh, we'll never tell them, no, we'll never tell them. We'll say there was a war somewhere, but damned if, knew, if we knew where. Yeah. Is it a form of stoicism, a sort of, I, I do, kind of a stiff upper lip idea that one shouldn't talk about one's sufferings that has perhaps gone? I think it's a form of actually layering something down so you can get on with the rest of your life. But, I mean, I'm not sure that Sue would agree with that. I think the problem with not evoking the memories is that they come up and get you. It's a very unexpected time in a different part of your life cycle when you're having your children or even your grandchildren. I agree with you from World War One. There was this sense of stoicism. So my father-in-law left Poland during the war. We never spoke to him about mm. it. He never talked about exactly. it. And he died. With that, that. do I you think, think that was bad for him, or or did you respect it? Or I, re I respected mm. him. I think in this day and age, there's this pressure to out everything, which goes with all the rest of things that goes with culture and celebs. And I, so I, I think we, it's a shifting culture that's mm. partly putting pressure. But on. do we not learn from those experiences? If you just put them down and never go back to them, are they almost wasted in a sense? I. Well. I mm. Or if I put it in a more, slightly more personal way, I mean, if, if each of you had the choice to erase your most painful memory, would you do that? Or would you feel that that would somehow change who you are in a way that you wouldn't want? Definitely not. That's part of me. That's part of who I am. Well, I may have erased the most painful memories already, so I only have a second <laughs> one. <laughs> 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 You've forgotten whether you have or not. Yes, no, I was thinking there was a very interesting piece, and I'm going to get this slightly wrong, but people will correct me, by Oliver Sacks recently, where he was talking about this is a painful memory or an agitating memory, a dramatic memory of being in the war as a little boy uh, with his family and his brother, and the house was bombed, and he vividly remembered passing the buckets of water along the street back to the house. Um, and he published this memory. He told the story, and his brother, older brother, got in touch with him and said, actually, you weren't there. I passed the buckets. I told you about it. 
uh, but you actually weren't there. And he, <laughs> Oliver Sacks, of all people, was completely astonished and dumbfounded by this and realised that his one of his most painful memories was not his own memory. But that makes a very important point, because the memory was real to him, yes. because it had been remade. So the distinction that we always have to have is between, if you like, a historical narrative and a personal narrative, and they don't match up. I mean, you remember things that have happened to you because um, I have wartime memories as well. And yeah. um, whether they're things that I've been told or things that happened mm. to me is a little unclear. Sometimes the memories are classically those of a child. Mm. Our memory forms actually change around um, sometime in 8 and 10. Most early childhood memories are eidetic. They're sort of photographic memories. And mm. you remember things as snapshots, as pictures, an intense sense and so on. Mm. The sorts of linear memories that we have now. Um, as, as, as adults, only really sort of begin to clock in, sort of in, in around the age of eight or ten, and so on. Um, so, but I think there are some things that you have memories of as a child, which are only child memories. They have to be because you see adults in a particular, large sort of way, um, in, in, in a way that has to be a child memory and not, as it were, a told memory. But is that is that semantic? When when you say there are lots of wartime episodes of people passing buckets in the streets in the Blitz and the sorts of things that happen to families in the Blitz, could one, as it were, appropriate that as a semantic sure, memory not? so that you think it's part of your own experience sure. that happens, right? It seems to me that a lot of the things we've been talking about in terms of negative or positive effects of memory, also the fact that memories might not actually match up with what happened are true for individuals but they're also true for societies as a whole is, is that how you would see it yes if, if, if i start on this i'd come back to some of the very important points that sue was making at, at, at the beginning about the form of social memory and yeah. <laughs> how memories get embodied in social consciousness in a particular sort of way and there are two things that i think have changed in our culture over the course of the our technological culture over the course of the last century the invention of photography I mean, you can go back to the invention of writing, if you like, because um, that, that encodes memories, historical memories, which were originally given only orally. But photography and then cinematography, videos, DVDs, and so on, fix memories in a particular sort of way. So there are unforgettable memories of people of my generation, of um, the child in the Warsaw Ghetto, the young burnt child walking down, running down the street in Vietnam, the child being shot by the Israeli soldiers in the um, in, in in Gaza a few years ago, being sheltered by his father. Those memories are, are fixed by the photographs, and they actually therefore they stabilise memories in a particular sort of way, and they also give rise. And I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it changes things. But above all, there are collective memories, and we're interested in forgetting now, which is, I think, important. You mentioned very early on the, the Holocaust. Now, I'm a child of Holocaust survivors, and I say this with great deference, but I actually think it is high time we forgot the Holocaust. We forgot the Holocaust not merely because it is only one of a, a huge sequence of horrific events over the course of the past hundred years or so, but also because stabilizing that memory fixes a memory in a way which is actually then used as a cultural narrative in order to, in, in, in order to justify any old atrocity which the Israelis now be, might be doing in, in Palestine, for example. So the fixation of that memory, which I think is time to forget in the way that it's become the Holocaust industry, is a very important social act. So that's the sort of forgetting I'd like to see. So what... what would <laughs> what would you make of that? Are there times when, as a society, we just need to forget something and move on? Well, I'm quite pleased to hear you say that, but, but across society there are increasing numbers of parts of society who are laying down memories, real or not real, and each one is moving on and focusing on that. And I think that leads to a lot of the difficulties we now experience. M my key problem is with young people they have a relentless focus on the happenings of the moment so they cannot remember yesterday and I worry that they will not be able to develop a social identity other than as part of today's happenings and I think that is going to be very detrimental to how their personalities emerge and shape over time. So is that because of social media you mean they're all yes. on Twitter? Or... Um, do you see the same? Do you see that? I've I wasn't so much thinking about that, but about the, the question of remembering a national remembering of the past, mm. which, of course, is also a rewriting. We all rewrite our pasts. We know that. 
uh, nations rewrite their past. It's called fabulation. Um, uh, and they also memorialize their past. And so one of the things that I uh, find difficult, for instance, is um, the wearing of poppies. Um, I know why we wear poppies or are or want to wear poppies for the, the, the end, to mark the end of the war, uh, to mark the deaths in the war, to mark the sacrifices in that war. The wearing of poppies has shifted to, to, to encompass other wars, which we might not feel quite the same about as we feel about the First World War and the Second World War. Um, but the wearing of poppies has also become a sort of convention uh, or something that, you know, all public figures must do in the kind of three-week run-up um, to the 11th of the 11th. Um, and it's almost as if the wearing of poppies has, has, be has become a distortion of what it is meant to memorialise, so that I sometimes worry that it's I don't mean it's a celebration, it's obviously a celebration of courage and sacrifice, but I sometimes worry that it, it stops us thinking about the hor horrific nature of what is being remembered. So there are forms of memorialising which, which make me anxious. I mean, it's kind of become a, a cliche, it's almost shorthand that you don't have to think about it's the original It's become a, a way. public necessity as a pub if you are a public figure mm. appearing on the television or to, to, to wear your book. You can get white ones. Mm. Yes, you can. Um, I've had one more question for you all before we move on to a general um, Q&A session with the audience. Um, so it sounds like our memories aren't accurate, that sort of historically accurate and we do tend to rewrite them. And my understanding is that there's actually sort of psychological benefits in doing that in the way that we choose to remember perhaps the positive things more than the negative things. So to be sort of psychologically healthy, you need to rewrite your past. But then with technology now, when photographs are being taken of every single moment and being put online and with everybody blogging we're being confronted with the actual reality of our past all the time so is that a is that a problem that um we're not going to be able to rewrite our past in the way that we have done previously i think it changes us go back into family photographs of events you've actually forgotten and um i think it changes the way you actually view your own life being able to doing that whether it's for good or bad i simply don't know but that that um, we can't regard the existence of having memories as outside the culture and the technology and the society in which we live. They're actually totally embedded in that, mm. just as we are as individuals. I just worry that <laughs> children in the next generation are going to become the 15-second memory goldfish. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> but also, we all know that photographs are incredibly misleading about the past. Mm. You know, mm. we all look at our family photographs when we're all lined up smiling in front of the turkey or whatever it is and, and actually someone was having an incredible strop off shot just a minute before and someone else was about to walk out of the room and the turkey wasn't cooked properly anyway and so these kind of endless memorials of our lives it should be t taken with huge pinches they're just as misleading as our yes. memories <laughs> um i guess we'll leave it there um can i just thank all of our speakers thank you.